Good afternoon, Nick. Good afternoon, Stuart. Wade, or Terrence, how are you today? Well, we're all good here, Bob. Um, you can see by my. <laughs> all right. We'll get started here. We've got uh, one minute. Hey, Bob, maybe check the keyboard. There might be a loose nut or something. Ladies and gentlemen, I have three o'clock, and we've got uh, 30 plus on the call. So, um, I'd like to start us off. Sure. Thank you, Bob, and welcome everyone to our latest edition of the Economic Recovery Task Force for Boone County. And appreciate your time once again. Uh, I know that this is continuing to be a busy time for everyone, and uh, so carving out an hour or so for us each week. Uh, we don't take lightly, so thank you for that, and um, look forward to seeing what kind of information is available and how things are hopefully trending upward. So, well, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chair. We are uh, ready to go here. Um, we've got a good group with us today. Our mission remains the same, which is to make sure we do it right. Um, here's our agenda. We'll go through the subgroup updates. Um, Normally, I started off here with an update for the governor's uh, 1.30 press conference. However, he is at the White House today. He just had finished a meeting with the president and the vice president. Apparently, they're meeting with all the governors over a three-day period one-on-one. -on -one. And um, so we'll get a report. He's going to be live on his press conference at uh, 4.30 this afternoon. So let's jump in, and Vince, uh, we'll go to you first. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. I know Sammy, I think, I believe she's on the line as well. Our um, update is not uh, going to be as extensive as it was last week. I want to walk through a couple of things to give you a summary of how we are, are moving forward. Uh, earlier, uh, I had given you the criteria for the hospital to begin doing 
uh, elective surgeries or elective procedures. This was, this was, uh, this was promulgated from the governor's office on, or the Arkansas Department of Health on May 11th. The change here, if you notice on number two, was the addition of the ASA rating class three, which gives us opportunity to bring people with a little more comorbidities and a little, a little more risk to the hospital. And then um, subsequent to that, we were uh, given the next slide, which was an update on May the 15th, Friday, May the 15th. And uh, if you notice, there's an addition to that slide when Bob gets that, uh, gets that going there. The addition to that slide is that as of uh, effective May 18, that we were allowed to uh, extend the time frame for a pre-operative test to 72 hours. Now we have not done that. We are still sticking to the 48 hours. If you go back one slide, Bob, uh, for me real quick. This is an interesting, uh, the, the question here is preoperative patients. The previous document I gave you was for procedures. So there's a, a semantical difference here. Preoperative patients obviously are for those patients that will be exposed. We will expose those patients to anesthesia to uh, some type of aeros aerosolization procedure. So um, it's a little less restrictive, but, um, and I do expect by Friday this week, according to Dr. Bledsoe from the Department of Health, that they're going to relax these standards a little bit more. So if you go to the next one and finally the third slide, um, this is a letter that I'm going to put in the newspaper here uh, soon and it really boils down to is that uh, we're taking special precautions here at the hospital to make sure the environment's clean to make sure the environment is safe so that we are now uh, at, at a point where we believe it's safe for the community to begin to return to the hospital and to the clinics to receive the health care that they have missed now one of the, well, the critical things here i think is important and i believe i mentioned it a little bit last week that there has been a significant drop in orders for vaccines for children. Uh, that's the vaccines that children should receive before 24 months. So we need to make sure that we're taking care of those kids because uh, folks that are my age, and if you look at the picture from the little computer here, my hair was brown in January, so that makes any difference how what we've been doing up here. Uh, the point that I'm making is that if this these vaccine controlled diseases become prevalent in children folks like bob and i and our vaccinations were years ago so now we're going to have another problem that compounds the COVID 19. so we're uh, inviting the community to come back to the hospital and to the clinics to get those chronic conditions dealt with to get those things that have been put off dealt with now's the time and then finally my last comment will be um, as you can see by the numbers in the state, as we begin to open things up, we're having a spike in cases. Um, I really want to influence our community and the people who are on this call to wear those face coverings when you're out in public. If you can't keep that six foot distance, wear a face covering, uh, cloth face covering, surgical mask, whatever you got, wear those face coverings. And, you know, I think it's really important. We got to protect our community. We got to protect ourselves, and we need to really push wearing face masks. Right, and when you're out, you go to the grocery store. Um, you know, there are some bankers on here. I'm not sure we want to wear a mask when we go into the bank. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. But the point <laughs> is, let's make sure that we are protecting ourselves, and let's try to influence others to wear those face masks when that six foot distancing cannot be cannot be made. And I'll turn this over to Sammy for her comments. Thanks, Vince. Good afternoon. Um, just want to say that I think Vince's point that we need to continue to be diligent as we see the spike in cases. We're seeing a spike in what's being seen at the viral screening clinic. Uh, we are continuing to do the pre-op patients through there as well. I also think that we need to understand that just because a patient receives a negative COVID test does not necessarily mean that they are virus free. Um, there are 30 to 40% of these tests that still have 
a false negative, meaning that the person has the virus, it just wasn't detected on the test that was performed. So from our perspective, um, our physicians are meeting two times per week. They're reviewing the algorithm. They're following the Arkansas Department of Health clinical guidelines, but they're also going to be sharing with patients that just because your um, COVID-19 test was negative, you may still have the virus and we're still recommending that you be quarantined if you're symptomatic. And we also may be retesting patients that initially test negative, continue to have symptoms, and just to see if we can catch that um, positive virus on a test. We're still seeing that patients are symptomatic and having negative tests and then returning and having a positive test. So there is community spread. We need to be really diligent in what we're doing. And as we start to expand services, we need to be cautious about how we do that. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. If there's any information that's needed, I'm happy to provide that. And let me, uh, let me preface this next chart. We were asked by the State Chamber of Commerce to, uh, to promote the Arkansas Rural Clinic free testing for COVID-19. And so from Boston Mountain Rural Health Center there in Marshall, they're the ones that cover Boone County. Um, all the chambers are, are promoting this at the request of the Department of Health. Um, they were here last week on May 13th, did 151 tests. All were returned negative. Um, according to, and, and I know that Sammy, you talk, and many you probably do too, with Debbie Ackerman on a regular uh, basis. They did 597 tests last week. 517 were complete as of last night, and they had zero positives. The the question that that Debbie or I posed to Debbie, and you reiterated that, so I'd appreciate your comments. Is um, some of those 517 that tested negative could, in fact, retest today and be very and be positive. Um, but the the Department of Health with the chamber has asked all of the uh, all of the folks to to get this out because it's being paid for with federal and state dollars for as many tests as possible. Um, their second day of testing uh, that they did in Mountain Home today, they had 160 something last week. As of noon today, they had 25. So people seem to rush for the first day, but are not doing any more. Um, but again, the false negatives are a real concern, even though the e-swab is supposedly the most reliable. Your comments, Vince or Sammy? Well, I think there's a couple of things that we need to kind of bring forward. Um, there are many types of tests and there are many opportunities for them to be um, inaccurate. And it could be the testing materials themselves. Right. It could be the methods by which they're administered. Um, some, some tests are, uh, if, you have, if you've had a, a COVID-19 test, it is unpleasant. Um, and I think it's important that um, uh, we understand that we're operating under some different guidelines here at the hospital. I, I know I've shared those guidelines with you, that um, we are testing patients that are, uh, have been exposed to a person who is COVID positive, or we are testing patients who are symptomatic. Right. And uh, we are being very mindful of uh, the volume of tests that we have. And I think Sammy's told you over time, we have some rapid tests in the hospital, but they are limited to uh, populations of patients that we either have a very sick inpatient or something that we need to, to arrange for immediately to understand what's going on. Um, when these programs began of you know, test everybody, test them now, 
we are still operating under the guidelines from the Department of Health, which are very different than this. So um, I think it's important that we test as many people as possible. However, um, I don't, um, I, I don't want to say this is not an appropriate method to do so. I just want to make sure that we're serving our community in the fashion it needs to be served. So um, I know they've invested a lot of time and money in these in this testing, and I hope that uh, there is uh, added value. We are, you know, still struggling to get testing materials, swabs, testing media, and. Uh, uh, we've seen a lot of different directions from the Department of Health. Right. And some of them are in conflict with one another. Uh, just know that we're licensed by the Department of Health and we are uh, obligated to follow their guidelines. And, and, so, and I think, Vince, that's why I wanted your, uh, your comments. Um, uh, this, this, I think, is the push by the Department of Health uh, mid to later, latter part of last week. Mm -hmm. Testing didn't seem to be in the right numbers, and so they task the uh, the rural health centers or the community health centers to go out and do these this massive number of testing. I don't know where they're getting them. I didn't ask. Uh, uh, wasn't provided the information. Um, however, you know they're there. Yeah. Now. Well, you know, Sammy's still on the phone. I'll let her comment on this as well. You know, the nasopharyngeal swabs are the most effective. And so um, as we do the, the nasal swab, it's difficult to get to get as far back in the nasal cavity where this virus resides. And so I think that you also have to put into account the way in which the test is performed. The other issue is the burn rate for personal protective equipment that we're using um, in these type of, of environments. And so we're also, as we're managing, Vince said, the testing supplies, we're also managing our access to um, personal protective equipment and making sure that we're utilizing that appropriately, because I do anticipate that we're going to have an influx of inpatients. We are going to see people sicker in the community. Um, we're calling people to check on them and give them results. And they're telling us that they're supposed to be quarantined, but they're out in the community. And so, um, I think that it's it's really important, as Vince said, the testing mechanisms are there, but the social distancing, the social isolation, the quarantining of sick patients is almost, if not more important than a negative COVID test. I, I, I agree. The thing that kind of surprised me when we were asked yesterday by the state chamber to, to help promote the community health center testing was my immediate thought was, oh my gosh, they tested 150 something. We're going to get, you know, a good number back that were positive. And uh, the report this morning was out of the 151, none are positive. So that raises the question that you highlighted, Vince. What about the false negatives and how many of these could actually be? And are they going to retest anybody? You know, if well, somebody takes let, well, let me bring up let me bring up one one issue, and I think we just need to be clear with with everybody who's on the call. Um, each of the hospitals in the state are reaching into the same bowl to try to get enough tests for their community, yeah. and we're struggling. You know, the Department of Health has been doing some testing, but most of the testing in this state's being done by commercial laboratories. I mean, UAMS is doing some. So we're all reaching into the same bowl to make sure that we have adequate supplies for our community. And then these kinds of testing programs are released by the Department of Health okay. with a seemingly unlimited amount of tests. So we're a little, frankly, we're a little frustrated that uh, we have not been able to obtain the same um, volume of, of devices and equipment that we would need to support this community. but. Um, in a situation like this, in which they're, we're writing the rules as we go, we're going to have bumps in the road yeah. and we're going to have conflicts between different organizations. But um, our frustration is based on our, our mission to care for this community. 
So we are doing our darndest to acquire everything we can get our hands on to not only protect the community, but to protect our staff members, which are the families in this community. So um, I support testing. I don't necessarily, um, I'm a little frustrated with the way the state is distributing access to testing materials. Um, but here we are, um, we're on the pony, we're all going down the same same little path. So uh, we need to stick together because this, this virus is not, it doesn't care uh, male or female, it doesn't care if you're uh, living under a bridge or in a mansion. Um, it's gonna, it, it, it has, it's, it doesn't discriminate. Yeah. So we must find ways to care for everybody in our community. Yeah, that's good. I, pr I appreciate that. Um, uh, it's, you know, this is the serious issue that we're faced with, and that's why uh, we want the healthcare team to lead off. Let's look at Main Street businesses. Joan, you have a report? Hi, do, Bob. Um, basically, um, our group has kind of stopped meeting um, primarily because we've been so busy. I think all of us are back to work, at least trying to move forward with the what's new and what we can do. I know I've visited with just a few people. I went and got my hair cut today, wore my mask, and they were opening the door for me. Please, you know, please let me open the door for you. You know, those types of things so that they were handling as much as those things. So they weren't having to clean as much, but they were still doing that the entire time I was in there. I stopped by good guys pizza. They actually did have what looked like a buffet, but they were, they were serving people. So they were following the guidelines. I think all of your main street businesses are doing the best they can to follow the rules, try to keep everybody safe. So we have kind of stopped meeting. And as a matter of fact, most people aren't even responding to my emails now, but I think that's a good sign. I think it's a sign that they have everything that they need and that they know where to go to get more supplies if they need something and that everything is going well and they're back, you know, earning a living and trying to take care of the community. So I think that's a good sign. Good, Joan, thank you. And um, I appreciate that. Uh, I think keeping in contact and keeping that collaboration going is going to be important. And guys, I apologize. I uh, I skimmed over Dr. Josh Keener, who's on the phone. Josh, uh, can you give us an update on what's happening in the world of dentistry in Harrison? You bet. We're uh, still in phase one, so we're behind the medical team. But uh, I'd reiterate kind of what Vince said that you know, everybody cares for your patients, but you have to use a little common sense on some of these. We're frustrated um, kind of with some of the regulations we get from the Department of Health and some of the lack of clarity we receive. Um, just sharing with everybody that's on here, our state dental association actually sent a letter to the governor. They drafted a legal letter from our attorney and they were concerned that maybe the Department of Health is kind of overreaching the executive branch and trying to, uh, you know, mandate what is done without, you know, maybe not 100% good science or just common sense. We learned last week that approximately 85% of the manufacturers making our N95 mask, they uh, they failed the FDA test. They're they're not of the quality deemed necessary to be counted. So I think we're going to, if we see these spikes, which is expected to go back up as we start getting back out in the community, I think the personal protective equipment, the PPE for our medical staff may become an issue. So I think using some common sense on what we're doing, the, the universal testing, like Vince said, it, it may be a good thing, but I had a patient that they were called by this is what they told me. I don't have any facts said that they were called by the Boston mountain telling them to come get tested. But the patient was 90 something years old. I, I kind of with asymptomatic, you know, I kind of question why would you want to get a 90 year old out and expose him to these other people and burn up a bunch of PPE stuff. But um, I think we're all in it together. I know all of our patients have been fantastic. We've kind of been juggling. We're, not letting them in the waiting room. We're, you know, moving them straight back to a treatment operatory. We're trying to let treatment rooms 
rest in between patients so we're not running at full capacity or anything and right. lots of disinfection and we're making you wear a mask um, as the Department of Health recommends so if you're in the building and right. just some common sense I'm, I'm worried that some people may I, I hear a lot of patients saying I'm just kind of over this I'm over COVID I don't think this is the time that you get over it. I think you have to keep washing your hands keep wearing your mask because you're gonna see a spike on this deal but like like Vince said, and like Sammy said, you know, we all care about our community. We all care about our patients, and we have their best concerns and our team's best interest. That that that's our main concern. Josh, that's I, 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 I appreciate that very much. I think you highlight something that uh, I think everybody on here probably is aware of. We just need to be more sensitive to and aware of. Uh, what's going to happen as people say, I'm tired of this. I don't want to do it anymore. You go to stores and you see people without masks and, and it, it is kind of frustrating. And I, that's got to be one reason that there, we see a spike, but uh, appreciate uh, the input here. And thanks to you and Vince and Sammy. Uh, you're welcome. For missing you. All right. From the, the prime team, uh, Jimmy, you're on. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Um, kind of like the mainstream team, team has not been meeting, but we do appreciate everything that the Main Street team has done to prepare the community um, for the social distancing and the protocols that we have in place. I, I have seen that myself um, by the Main Street teams, and uh, we appreciate that. We continue to reemphasize with our employees that, um, you know, this thing is not over. West Rock in general is saying they don't plan to let up until August, September time frame, you know, no matter what. So um, we just continue to let people know that it's not over. We still need to take it seriously. And uh, just emphasize, you know, if you don't see um, folks following the protocols, then, you know, try to stay away from those areas. Uh, keep everybody safe here and, and safe at home. And that, that's all for prime business. That's very good, Jimmy, and I, I think you're you're right. I appreciate that very much. Thank you, um, Dr. Pratt. You're on. Stuart, you're on. Uh, do you have any Thank other you. input other than the graduation has been announced? I do. I I do have. If I could just take just a moment. Uh, Friday is the close to Harrison Public Schools for the 2019-2020 school year, and uh, it's kind of bittersweet. Uh, we are preparing for next year for a multi-path approach to student learning uh, in the fall. Uh, we want to also uh, communicate that uh, we are working hard to crush down any inequity that may live amongst our learners, uh, whether it be connectivity to Wi-Fi or cellular service. We're going to find a way to crush that down as the best as our ability. Uh, we believe everybody deserves a first-class education, and Harrison's the place to get it. Uh, we're building a playbook for all of our learners for next fall. Um, for those of you that are parents or have students, or if you could support us, that'd be great. We'll be bringing out a playbook to show what some of those will be looking like. And lastly, we believe that uh, our staff, Harrison staff, knows Harrison area students better than anyone. And uh, we'll be ready to work with your students, whether it be on-site or off-site next year. So that's our report right now. And we appreciate all the parents and the hard work they did this spring in this awkward time and uh, just a big kudos and thank you yes uh, good sure, thanks you might turn your turn your mic off i got it uh Stuart, i have a question uh does what uh, things are you putting in place for the fall are you doing some kind of training? Yeah, we're doing a lot of training right now. That's a great question. Uh, I know you probably can't see me on the screen, but basically we're looking at, at, at building uh, um, an education system that be able to pivot quickly. So back to Vince and Sammy and uh, our medical professionals, you know, there could be, we could be on site next year in the fall and start up and then all of a sudden be forced to go off site or we may be off site. It doesn't matter. We're trying to build an educational system 
uh, with uh, on-site and off-site av availability on a moment's notice. So our staff is really heavily uh, involved in some training right now and, and uh, lesson writing that'll be able to do either one of those type paths and be able to pivot based on what our medical uh, needs are in our state and provide a great learning environment for our kids. So a lot of work going on, a lot of work. We've really been grinding it out this last week and we'll be doing a lot of work this summer. Uh, that's that's great to know that, uh, Stuart. Um, I'm not sure, is Rick Nance on the call today from the OUR co-op? Uh, they were up next, but Stuart, if he's not, do you have any indication what some of the other uh, smaller districts are doing? Sure. Well, first off, uh, our co-op has some tremendous schools, and I mean, I don't need to say that. You guys know that. you got kids involved in some of those sister districts around us. But again, uh, that's what education is trying to do is be flexible and be able to pivot. And I ask you to just throw away, for those of you that are parents, throw away that AMI packet mentality that we had to do this spring. That's not what next fall is going to look like. We're going to try to move away from that into a better platform of learning for uh, K-12 educators. Uh, our big concern is teaching kids how to read, and that occurs in kindergarten, first and second grade. We don't know how we can do that and not be on site. So we're looking at some of those logistical items, but uh, we have to have great workers for our local industry. We have to have great kids that'll move towards military service, and we have to have great kids that'll move towards college career path. So we've got to get our kids in the right place and be able to be flexible based on the medical conditions that are in our environment. That's great, thank you very much, sir. Um, and Dr. Esters, did you make the call? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, good. Here's, uh, you've got classes that begin next week. Well, we got, they're all online. Uh, you know, we're following the phase one that the governor's talking about, but we're probably taking it a little slower. Uh, we're not allowing large groups uh, of classes. We're still keeping the, the PPEs in place, you know, the, the face masks are requiring that. And doing just like Dr. Pratt said, we're planning for fall. Uh, our summer is going to be primarily online. We may have a couple of technical classes, but we're, we're just going to be super cautious, uh, follow guidelines that that we we think will keep our people safe but the reality is just just like everybody's been saying we're just holding our breath waiting for this thing to pop up and explode and hopefully we're not in the center of it i guess that's that's yeah. just about where we are okay good good any questions for uh for dr pratt or dr esters yeah bob i had a couple of questions um the first one would be more for dr pratt this is matt bell um the summer food program for students, have, is that being planned out? Um, I know that there's a lot of kids that depend on that source of, of a meal every day. Great question, Matt. Yes, it is. Uh, currently with our uh, guidance from uh, the state health department, they will not allow us to feed in our cafeteria. So we're looking at a drive-through service and uh, it's, I believe it begins June 1 but we'll be running that through the summer for food. And uh, we'll probably get more guidance on whether we can deliver some of those meals to places for people that may not be able to get out. Okay. And then my other question, I, I'm sure either you or Dr. Esters could answer, but the uh, ACT testing, um, are there on-site tests available for students um, out there that are still looking to get into college? They've, they've waived a lot of the testing requirements. Uh, we're doing primary, mostly uh, remote testing using Zoom and other uh, some testing protocols that we put in place. But no, the testing center is not open. Uh, that's a that's a phase two thing, and we're hoping we can get that rolling here before long. But it it's not holding us back. If they want in, uh, we can either get them the test or use some other uh, entry awesome. protocol. Hey, and and. And the chamber was pleased to host last week each day uh, the GED testing from the college uh, with one uh, tester at a time, along with a proctor here. We closed the chamber uh, conference room for them to do that. I think they ran six people through here and all but one graduated. 
So we can do that again too, if you wish. Bob, if I can jump in for one last Please. piece. Yeah. The governor was supposed to communicate today some conversation about athletics and practice, things like that. That's been postponed till tomorrow. So okay. hopefully we'll know about uh, gatherings of students and college level kids together and whether or not how the practices may look. All right. Yeah, that's going to be very important. Thank you for that update. All right, let's jump to uh, the nonprofit group. Shonda, you got a report? Yes, sorry. Um, we've been meeting on a weekly basis on Mondays with nonprofits and the religious organization, and including the religious organizations. And as you all know, they are um, opening. Some are, some are not. Um, to have, you know, their Sunday sessions or Saturdays within the church, but following the guidelines. Um, I've also reached out to some of our local nonprofits and some of the bigger ones like us and Ozark Opportunities um, and a few others. We are not making any changes yet. We are still operating like we have been for the past several weeks because of the population we serve is the most vulnerable and the most at risk that we, you know, we really are urged by our, like I'm urged by head to not make any drastic changes yet to see how things go for the next few weeks and then start making a plan. Okay. Questions for Shonda and the nonprofit sector. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Matt, you're on with the tourism. Okay, I'll make it brief. Um, so uh, good news, uh, we did receive state funding, uh, Desti destination marketing organizations, CBBs, if you will, around the state of Arkansas, uh, received free advertising opportunities, uh, both radio and television. Those will be going out. Uh, it's actually June 1 is the drop date on those. So we'll be uh, Harrison specifically will be marketing outdoors and uh, trying to get people to our neck of the woods. Um, like I said, it is in-state advertising only for now until they open it up to phase two. Um, the next bullet there, there's a big concern in the um, uh, industry right now for encouraging or requiring employees to come back to work and then losing that, that benefit of the $600. And you know, they can come back to work, but if they don't provide great service as an employer, you don't want them there. Um, so that's, they're running into that issue. Uh, it's almost as if employees are asking to be terminated based on their work performance, because if they are, they can go back home and collect a paycheck, uh, which is disappointing. Um, and so I did share that uh, shared work program, Bob, that you had, you had mentioned, um, and immediately I had a response and I didn't have the answer to it. Maybe you do. The shared work program, if an employee was already on, an, on, on unemployment insurance, would they qualify for that? Would they qualify for the shared work program or is this for only new, newly unemployed employees? If that makes I, sense. I believe it's for all, Matt, but I'll uh, just let me know after this and I'll confirm okay. that it, it should be. And again, it's not an individual thing. It's up to the business right. the company right. to, uh, to designate them. Yes. Yeah. And then okay. the, the last thing um, with rising food costs, um, there is a, an initiative right now. Uh, and I'll, I asked if I could go ahead and announce it. And Angela Akers and Jamie Akers That's are going cool. to be reaching out to all restaurants in our area and trying to uh, join forces when it comes to their food orders uh, because there are discrepancies if you order in bulk versus if you order small loads. So she's putting that cooperative together. And as I get more information on that, I'll share. But if you're online right now, a part of this discussion, she said, just give them a call and they will make sure you're on the list. Um, if we already had your email here at the office, uh, she's supposed to be contacting you, but strength in numbers. Uh, I thought it was great on their part uh, to try to set that up and, and we're going to um, support it the best we can. I, and I, I appreciate that, Matt, and certainly to Jamie and Angela. Uh, I think in Matt's call earlier today, one restaurant was paying three fifty a pound for a hamburger. Another was paying six eighty something a pound. Same place, just in quantity. So uh, this is a giant initiative if it can happen. Yeah, that's great. Okay. 
Very good. Thanks, Matt. Questions? Any other questions? Okay. This Thank is you. Mike Neighbors. I have a question about the shared work program. Yes, sir. So I had looked at that previously, and um, there's a paragraph here that says, uh, are all employers eligible to participate? And it says that uh, you must not have had a temporary layoff of the affected group within the past four months. So I'm wondering if there's a waiver for that, because I read if there's not a waiver, I read that to say that the shared work program is not available to employers uh, during this COVID. I, uh, Mike, I think it is based upon the date that they've set. I'll confirm that and get back to you. Uh, but I know there are numerous businesses in the region that have done that um, and throughout the state. It's been a very well-received program. So I'll check with you on that. But I think it, the, when it says in the previous four months, um, I think that has to do with prior to the COVID-19 date, which is March. Uh, I think it's March 17th or 18th, but I'll confirm that. Okay, thank you. Good, thanks, Mike. Other questions? Okay. Uh, finance subgroup. Okay, Gwen. All righty. Hello, everybody. Um, our update this week, the SBA has uh, released instructions for the PPP loan forgiveness. There is an application that those that received this uh, item need to complete and return to your lender. And keep in mind that the uh, be aware that the eight week period begins from the date on the signed promissory note, not from the loan disbursement date uh, on that. So keep that in mind. Regarding PPP, as of 5 p.m. yesterday, uh, SBA had approved $4.3 million, uh, or sorry, 4.3 million loans amounting to over $512 billion uh, across both rounds of PPP. So that means there is still funds available for that program. Uh, there is a new payment deferral option for mor mortgage borrowers. If you uh, have a government-based loan, then you have a deferral option uh, on that item to inquire about. Also, if you are doing a forbearance, they are not requiring you to repay in a lump sum, uh, where some were requiring that and it wasn't helping those people out at all. So now with the government-based ones, that is not a requirement. Also, the home builder's confidence improved following April's drop. So that is good. Um, in the uh, Midwest, they at least increased seven points since the drop, and the South has increased eight points since the drop. And then mortgage rates currently are around 3.2% on average. They expect that to go down closer and under three by the end of the year, possibly. And then just a few items on what inventory is being looked at. Uh, I think in the area we're still moving decently. Uh, it has slowed down just a little bit as far as uh, the, that going from just a few weeks ago. But all is looking at least decent. Um, and as far as banks in the area, as of Probably by the end of next week, half of our banks should have a lobby open. Half are still waiting till June or later to open their lobbies. Those are soft openings. They're still encouraging their customers to continue to lose the, use the drive through and um, not come in unless it's just absolutely necessary. And if you do come in, some banks are requiring masks to be worn. Um, we are working on the protocols and how to identify people when they come in with a mask. So that's where we are. As in uh, good guys or bad guys? Exactly. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Questions for Gwen and Scott and Scott and the other bankers that are on the phone. Anyone? It's good news on the housing market and good news on uh, uh, the SBA. Uh, by the way, I've gotten at least four emails today from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the AEDC, um, and uh, the IEDC about the PPP forgiveness application. 
it's important. Your loan cannot be forgiven any portion of it without this application being submitted. So um, uh, it's on the Chamber's website uh, with a link to the forgiveness application. So encourage you to pass that word to everyone. Okay, Gwen, thank you. Hey, I got a quick question. Um, yes. I'm sorry I keep on bugging the education sector. Uh, Dr. Pratt, if you're still on, uh, with the housing market doing well, people may be possibly moving into the area. How, is, how are students going about, and this will be useful for those bankers, how are students going about getting registered for school uh, for the coming fall? I'd encourage them right now, Matt, to come on into the district office and we'll get them registered. But we're working on an online registration platform as we speak. It's just not ready to be deployed just yet. Great. Thank you. And, and Stuart, when you get that online registration, if uh, you let the task force know and we'll begin to promote it widely as well with the newspaper. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love that help. Yeah. Thanks, sir. All right, infrastructure. Jim, Dottie, Mark. Yeah. Hey, Jim's here. Um, no, we have nothing new to report. Everything's staying the same. We're just monitoring, but no changes as of right now. Good. All right, questions for these this team? Thank you. Uh, government. Uh, Judge Hathaway is out of town, and I'm not sure we have anybody on from the county. So, uh, Terry, how are things down in Valley Spring? I, I go with uh, what he, what the previous fellow just said. No real changes for us. Uh, like I said, we went, we went, opened the office back up, and uh, again, no real updates. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's all good. And Mayor Jackson. Yeah, Bob, uh, we were able to have our first city council meeting last Thursday night uh, live. Uh, we were able to hold that out at the college and that John Paul Hammerschmidt room really, uh, really works well for meetings right now. It's large enough to distance. But three things we had on the agenda that I think may be of interest. Uh, we have a, uh, a grass ordinance. We have a clean premise ordinance that includes cutting the grass. And as you all know, grass is growing rapidly right now. That ordinance allows 14 days after the day the complaint is filed for the person to uh, cut their grass. We are recommending that we change that to seven days. Uh, so that'll be a move up. We also have an ordinance on the agenda uh, calling for a rental permit uh, in light of the fatal fire we had a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we are asking landlords to file their information on any facilities containing three units or more. And this is something we've gotten uh, some strong pushback on. So hopefully we can get something passed in that area that allows our fire inspectors to, uh, to go around and check uh, rental facilities on a yearly basis and make sure they have working uh, is smoke detectors and, and some other things. So the other thing of interest, we are proposing a, uh, we call it a salvage ordinance. It's not necessarily for salvage yards only, but it does include salvage yards. It includes the recycling areas, actually any commercial or industrial facility that has uh, all junk automobiles, junk of any kind, and they have it within 100 feet of the street uh, with a fence. We're requiring that they screen those fences. And when you drive around town, there's quite a bit out there. And I think we can make Harrison look a whole lot better by enforcing uh, an ordinance of this type. So those are three things that, uh, that we have on the books right now. I think the one thing I'm real interested in, and you brought it up earlier, and that's the fact of wearing masks. I really thought by this time we'd be seeing a lot more people out there wearing them, and we're not. Um, I wish there was something we could do. Um, I don't know if there's any suggestions uh, from the audience, but uh, we might need to become a little more proactive in this area. You know, we had the six campaign, but uh, but maybe we should have had a mass campaign. But uh, 
any advice in that area, I'd appreciate. That's it, Bob. Thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. I think you uh, you highlight that point that uh, the healthcare team also talked about, and that's wearing masks. I am surprised at the number of people that go into public uh, locations um, with large numbers of people that are not wearing masks and don't seem to care. So uh, it's an education process. I think that's what we need to do and just keep that up. And, and perhaps with uh, our local media here in town, uh, we can begin a campaign of encouraging that. Uh, what we don't want to do is have to report a, a spike in, in positive cases and, and use that as the impetus to, uh, to get people to comply. But hopefully that, that'll work. Questions for the mayor or anybody else on the task force? Bob, I've got a quick question for the mayor. This is Jim Perry. Uh, you know, June is uh, yard sale month, and we've been getting a lot of calls here at the office, uh, people wanting to advertise their yard sale and uh, questions about if there's any limit on, you know, how big a yard sale can be or if there's any local restrictions within the city limits on uh, yard sales and, uh, uh, you know, safety precautions that need to be enforced or could be enforced by the, the city. Is there anything uh, going on with yard sales? Yeah, uh, no, Jim. There are uh, no restrictions to my knowledge. I believe uh, Wade may be on the call right now. He may want to comment to that. But uh, to my knowledge, no, there's not. Okay. I appreciate that. We've got some uh, yard sale promotions coming up. And also, Mayor, uh, we'll certainly... Uh, see if we can put together a local campaign on some of these safety precautions that are kind of being ignored a little bit like our masks. Cause I think the six foot, uh, uh, the sixth campaign was pretty effective. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Okay. Um, uh, thanks everyone for your participation today. Let me ask if there's any other questions uh, we have of the task force before uh, Joe would wrap us up and I think uh, the shark that's up there now tells the story. I have one quick question for the mayor if possible. You bet. Yeah, go ahead. Regarding your inspections, uh, just regarding the inspections, I would like uh, to encourage you all to work with Shonda. I think there's some items there she has that could add some grit to that and some knowledge that I think would be beneficial to both parties. Yeah, uh, Gwen, actually all of their homes are required to be inspected. Yes, but I think there's a dual inspection item there that could benefit both. Mm -hmm. If we can work together on that. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, you bet. Shonda will be, Shonda will be involved, I promise you that. Thank you. Yeah, I think communication with both will, will benefit everybody. So. Yeah. Great. Thank okay. You. Thanks. Uh, I would like to ask if there's anyone on the call from the state legislative delegation. Are there any at all? Uh, any state representatives, state senators? I know that we've had some outreach to that group and uh, would, would love to hear any feedback from them. Flippo is not. Okay, Senator Flippo is not with us. For sure. Uh, Terry Garrett, I think you're on the line. Uh, do you have anything that you might add from the federal delegation and any news from Congressman Womack's office or any of your counterparts as to something that might be useful for us from the federal level? Are you with us, Terry? She is still on. She may be not. Oh, Terry, unmute. She says she doesn't know how to. Okay. Terry, uh, star six will unmute you. Okay. Okay. We'll be, we'll, we'll try to be better prepared next time um, and, and kind of include you on the agenda. Uh, I would also like to add, I think that we need to make a concerted effort to add somebody from the agriculture sector. Um, there was an announcement today that USDA is, uh, they kind of publish their guidelines, I should say, right. 
for uh, how they're going to pay, particularly cattle producers, but also crops and other things. Um, so Looks agriculture fine. is a big sector in Boone County, and it's important, I think, for us to have some feedback. Mm. So we'll see if we can find the right representative. Yeah. We, um, Luke, are are you on Luke Simon? You were earlier. Luke, if you're on. Okay, so Luke was on earlier. He's the vice president of the Boone County Farm Bureau and should have that information. I apologize that uh, he's not on the phone. Uh, we'll follow up uh, and get that information for sure. Yes, great. Nick Simon. Nick Simon. I'm sorry, I keep saying Luke and I apologize. Nick Simon. Okay. okay. So that's all I have. And uh, I'll, I'll just reiterate the comments. To thank you so much for all of you for attending and listening. We had about 40 participants, give or take one or two, uh, dropping in and dropping out. That's a really good representation for this many meetings in. And so it shows that everyone's still engaged and that's very important. And so until uh, next week, we uh, look forward to talking to you. Bob, anything else? That's it. Thanks very much to everyone. We thank appreciate you. it. Have a good, have a great Memorial, day. Memorial weekend. Yeah.